typical YouTube fishing tutorial that helps you add another tactic or fly to your arsenal. This is a video first of its kind and I know for a fact this is going to bite me in my ass sharing all our secrets. This is a video that will open up a complete new world on the fly rod for you. A world that's local, affordable, simple, and fun. Great for everybody at any level of experience. Where the action is popping off eight months out of the year, including the coldest of winter days on lakes that don't freeze over. If you have big bass in a lake nearby, this is the trick you've been waiting for to fool them on your five or six weight. Not only is this a deadly tactic for bass, it works on nearly any fish in less than 16 feet of water. We see 100 to 200 plus crappie days with this technique. Crappie on the float and fly is probably the easiest way for people of any age to get into good fly rod action. And for every 10 to 20 crappie we get, we get a bass too. These are fun fish on three or four weight crappie rods. Then there's the carp, a fish that's nearly impossible to catch on the fly, but the float and fly does the trick when you're going for bass. You want catfish on the fly? And yeah, it'll get trout, even landlocked salmon. It's gonna catch whatever fish are swimming around. fact about about Kirby he's the uh, person who showed me this this technique Kirby's a real serious conventional angler he's done uh, quite a few tournaments and stuff pretty pretty new to the fly fishing or he, he's been fly fishing for a long time now just not too never been too serious about it because he's he's uh, been on the tournament scene and and whatnot but he's uh, he's the one that told me Told me about the float and fly when I took him out, took him out for trout. He realized we we're fishing indicators, and he kind of told me, told me about the rig, and instantly, right when he told me, I knew there was there was really something to this. Um, so it's cool nowadays coming out here and, and watching Kirby Kirby fly fishing. He's really becoming a good good fly fisherman quick, and uh, it's pretty typical for for anglers in general. It doesn't take take long for good anglers to pick on to fly fishing it's all all common sense and if you're you're just a fisherman fisherman in general you're gonna pick on to fly fishing real quick Wakasagi in the chartreuse and white. Nice fish, Kirby. Just cruising along, switch location, switch flies. Yeah. Got right under the indicator, gave him a little shake so it, the fly kind of made a little movement like he was trying to screw him away. Right. That's it. typically use two different weights for the uh, the flies. It's the, the 132 ounce fly or the 116th ounce fly. 
95 percent of the time i'm fishing the 132 132 ounce fly a uh, little little bit lighter so this this rig is uh specifically for the 132 ounce fly from water depths of two feet anywhere to say nine and a half feet um, anywhere deeper than that i'm going to be using a, a different rig uh, uh yeah totally different leader uh, and a heavier heavier fly twice the weight at the 1 16th ounce so this leader is just strictly going to cover the 132 ounce flies in the uh, the shallower water which like I said it's what I use 95% of the time. So starting off these leaders are made of 100% uh, just Maxima Ultra Green. Uh, keep things nice and simple always. So from the fly line you're going to run 12 inches of 15 pound Maxima Ultra Green to the uh, the Jadicator loop knot uh, on the Jadicator, so the Lefty Cray loop knot and then at the other end of the uh, the Jadicator you do a, another loop knot with 10 pound Maxima uh, only eight inches of this, uh, real short, small little section. And then you tie the uh, the barrel swivel on after that. I like to have these butt sections last a couple trips, so I'll put a little uh, drop of UV um, knot sense on there, the thick, thick stuff. That'll keep the knots nice and fresh, uh, make the the leaders last a little bit longer. From the uh, the barrel swivel, now you're gonna run your your six pound. Six pound line just straight to the fly. Uh, the length of this depends on the type of water you're fishing. Um, so if it's a shallow, shallow water, gradual banks, you can go down to as little as two feet. Um, and like I said, for the steeper banks, I like going maybe nine and a half feet or so is the, the max I like throwing. Um, I do a lot of fishing with the six foot leaders, seven foot leaders. Uh, it's usually a real good length for me. Uh, and the goal with these these leaders is to have pretty much uh, zero zero taper in them. Basically, just the six pound from the the indicator to the fly, um, just a, a tiny little taper with that ten pound in there. Uh, the goal is to keep the line nice and thin so it cuts down uh, through the water as as fast as possible. This makes for uh, much more efficient uh, fishing throughout the day. Uh, having the, the proper indicator is, is very important. Uh, I, I like the Jadicators. These, these indicators have done me really well. Uh, info for the Jadicators will be in the, in the description. So I also want to touch base on the, uh, the original rig that I started out using. Uh, it's nice and simple. Um, it's just a uh, uh, three quarter inch thingamabobber with the 332 inch parachute post uh, UV glued onto the uh, onto the top and for that rig it was uh, it was real similar uh, I just ran one foot of the 10 pound Maxima to the uh, the indicator loop knot on there and then just the six pound loop knot on there straight to the fly from there so the leader was just 10 pound to six pound and the uh, the three quarter inch thingamabobber that was it uh, that leader did me real good for uh, three years um, did did great caught a lot of fish but it, it did tend to tangle quite a bit that's why I ended up um, making the line the butt sections a little bit thicker and adding in that uh, eight inches of the the ten pound at the, the top of the, the leader um, helps with the tangles a, a little bit makes the, everything last a little bit longer but if you want to go real simple and basic uh, just two types of line just the ten pound to the six pound will work good system's real simple, no need to overthink all this stuff. Very basic. Yeah. Hey everyone, I'm Kayla Katayama and I'm going to be showing you how to attach your pre-rigged leader to your fly line. First you're going to go ahead and you're going to take your monofilament loop and you're going to put it through your fly line loop right there. Next you're going to take your indicator and that's going to go back through your monofilament loop and you're going to go ahead and pull the rest of your main leader through that same loop as well. The last thing is you want to make sure that your loops are hugging your fly line. And that is how you attach a pre-rig leader to your fly line. As far as rods go, uh, any old six weight will do, but I prefer the 10 foot, 10 foot six weight rods. That extra foot helps with the roll casting, especially from the bank and the, uh, the longer leaders casting them, uh, getting fish up to the boat. Uh, and I'm just used to fishing the 10 foot rods on the rivers when I'm nymphing, so that's what I prefer. 
but I know a lot of people use the nine footers and nine foot sixes and those do them just fine. If I'm in a lake where I'm targeting crappie, uh, I prefer uh, three weights, four weights, sometimes five weights. Uh, those lighter rods will throw the float and fly just fine, especially the, the 132 ounce jig with the shorter leader, four or five foot leaders. And then when you hook uh, any, any bass, really, it's gonna be a fun fight on those, those lighter rods. You'll, you'll be able to land some big fish on the, the light rods too if you play them right. My favorite line is the Rio Salmo Steelhead. Uh, it's what I use nymphing in the rivers and same, same for the float and fly. Uh, it's, whatever line you're using, it's important that you, uh, you upline it though, so the, the seven weight line on a six weight rod. Here we got, we got the fly. This is the, the Williams Wakasagi, a little, little pattern I created a couple years ago. Deadly, deadly little fly. Okay, these are my three favorite patterns for uh, lakes, lakes like this, big canyon reservoirs. Uh, you'll find spotted bass, smallmouth, and whatnot. Um, these, these flies right here kill. A little, little chartreuse white on top. Got the, uh, the gray white for the, uh, the pond smell, the wakasagi imitation. Then we have Bodie's leech life fly. Just a, just an absolute killer little fly right there. So uh, we were just fishing with a little two, two fly system here. Bass took the bottom dropper, it's a little bait fish. On top we have the leech life. I've attached a loop to, that you can really put whatever knot you'd like. And uh, it's placed right behind the lead head there to give it balance. Show us the dropper fly. Dropper, just a little gray and white bait fish imitation. So you got the, that's the bottom one in your hand there? Yes. Yeah, the bottom and the top, top fly there doing the, the two fly system like we do on the rivers. On your cast, one of the important things is to pay attention to your float. This will tell you a lot about what's going on underneath your jig. It's when you lay it out, it'll lay completely flat on the surface until your jig is gonna sink down slowly, slowly, slowly. And then once it gets to 90 degrees below, it'll stand straight up and down. Your line's gonna lay flat, your jig's gonna be 90 degrees below it. If that jig does not lay straight up and down in the water, there is something going on with your jig. You have slack in your line. It means two things. Your jig's sitting on the bottom, or it's already in a fish's mouth. So get that slack in and set that hook. Or just get that slack in and get it underneath so that bobber will sit straight up and down. These bobbers will tell you a lot about what's going on there underneath your rig. A couple of strikes that you get with the float and fly, the lift bite. It'll be sitting there 90 degrees below your float. You will get a fish from the bottom, will grab it, it'll put slack in your line, this bobber will lay flat. There's slack in your line, set that hook for the fish on. The other bite you'll get is it's laying directly 90 degrees below your line, and all of a sudden it just starts swimming away. You'll just go under the surface. It's like Jaws taking the bobber down. It's, those are the fun bites. But pay attention to your bobber, it's gonna tell you a lot about what's going on with your jig. See, we're at a pretty, pretty steep bank here. Uh, don't don't want to cast too close, or else you're gonna snag on the bottom. And you don't want to cast out too far, or you're gonna be uh, 30 feet down or so, and we have a 10 foot leader or something. So it's all about putting it right in that that prime spot, the sweet spot. Uh, casting out about 20, 30 feet or so. Nothing nothing too far. So now for the casting. Uh, when we're in a boat. We're doing all the, the backhand casting, standard standard fly cast, it's not an issue. But when you're on the bank here, there's a ton of stuff to snag on. And when you're doing big long back casts, that fly is going to hit rocks or uh, sticks or whatever behind you and the fly is going to snap off. We've already lost a couple flies today doing that. Uh, so roll casts, and roll casts are really, really effective. Now what I'm what I'm doing here, I'm bringing it back really slow, and I'm making sure this line stops behind behind the rod before I cast. It's 
That's a really important part. You just want to drag that indicator and the fly real slow, both of them, just, just right on top of the water. And then fire down into it with your forearm. Come down, down into it. That's the roll cast. Accessing real steep structure from the bank is a lot easier said than done But you can find plenty of areas with steep drop-offs and you can just walk a walk up and around the, the steep stuff to keep keep moving on and accessing more water and sometimes a float tube pontoon kayak drift boat uh, Etc can work as a real good taxi from spot to spot on the bank Just exercise a lot of caution when navigating the shorelines on foot with the changing lake levels, a lot of times there's not really a designated path. There can be loose rocks and stuff. It can be pretty dangerous, so be on your toes. Oftentimes, tributaries can be the safest route down to the water, and it can be some of the best fishing for miles. Always give tributaries a try, no matter what time of year it is. As long as they're accessible, it's always worth a shot. But you don't always have to look for a real steep structure by any means. key to figuring out structure is finding patterns. Bass can be sitting on all the different structures that I mentioned, but they won't be sitting on each type of structure every day. Uh, certain days they'll feel like sitting on different types, so some days they'll be on trees, other days they'll be on the tributaries, uh, it, it just kind of keeps going on. These patterns can change uh, day to day, they can uh, definitely change week to week, and they'll, they'll for sure change month to month. So what you want to do is find a small portion of the lake and hit all the different types of structures you can. Hit the points, hit the trees, hit the rocks, the boulders, drop offs. Figure out where those fish are holding. Then really key in on the productive structures. Make yourself most efficient with your time. Another good tip to keep in mind, if you're fishing from the bank and from a boat, whatever, wherever you're fishing from, is to put your bait in the most prime position that it could be in. Put it in transition areas. If it's going from, say, behind me, you see some rock, you see some clay, you see some mud, fish those seams. Fish where it goes from the rock to mud or the big rocks to little rocks. Um, those little seams and little areas, those fish will go right into those areas. And you can almost pattern it to walking the bank, being on a boat. If there's a little tiny indention in the bank, fish it. Um, those fish will, they're cruising along the bank and all of a sudden there's a big rock. There's a piece of gravel. They'll stop and stay on that and feed. Wait for something to swim by them. They'll corral minnows, crawdads, whatever on it. So just put your bait in the most ambush position that you can there's going to be a fish there in one of those areas and just cover water until you get to one of those um, whether it be a float and fly whether it be a streamer if you're a conventional guy and fishing a jig whatever you may be try to find those transition areas An example of that transition area is right behind me and check this out we have these very large boulders out in front of me and it transitions over into red clay and scattered rock. Those fish are going to be holding right along this seam. It's like fishing a river where it has a little eddy. There's like a big rock seam through it. You want to fish right on that seam. Um, those fish are going to hold in there. It's their comfort zone. It's their home. You know, they have cover over here in the big rocks. If a crawdad's over here in the mud, it's easier to ambush than on 
these big boulders. That crawdad can crawl back in these rocks, it can hide in there very fast, but if crawdad's out here in these mud flats, they're gonna be able to eat them a little easier. So keep that in mind. Pattern. I'm gonna try to get it out there to where it suspends about two or three feet above the bottom. Just going along, seeing if these fish are right on the bank. You like that little chop on the water, makes the indicator just make little tiny movements and the little jig is down there dancing. Now that fly gets to the bottom of that indicator, just give it a few little pops there like it's trying to swim away. That fish will come up and look at it and it's just dead still. You do a couple little pops and it darts away a few inches and stops. You'll recenter under the indicator. You do rod twitches or strips. What you can't do is set to the side. What that's going to do, it's going to drive that hook into the corner of the mouth and it's really gummy over there. There's a lot of soft tissue. It doesn't have any bone to go into. Your hook set that you want is the rod tip's going to be pointed right at your indicator and set straight up. Awesome. Hell yeah. Nice, right on. What's your lease in there? The reason I started fishing the float and fly originally was because it was a whole new way to catch bass in the winter. Before this, uh, fly fishing for bass in the winter was, was really tough. Not only does this just work in the winter, it actually works better in the winter than in the summertime. When the water temperatures are around 55 degrees or lower, bass just can't really afford to turn down a meal dangling right in front of their face. There's really something to this. As long as your local lake isn't frozen over, don't ever be discouraged to use this tactic because it's too cold. And don't be afraid to start really early in the morning as the sun's coming up either. To put this into perspective, 20 to 50 fish days when we're out in the boat is pretty normal. And finally, the biggest fish of the year are usually caught during the winter, and it's not uncommon for the float and fly to win conventional bass tournaments this time of year. Probably the best time to throw the float and fly, however, is during the spring. Uh, we can get some real monsters during this time as well, and 60 to 80 fish days happen frequently. It just keeps on working throughout the winter into the spring, and the action absolutely fires off during March and April. During the fall, the fishing's pretty slow for the float and fly. If we get our first rains in October, November, action can really ramp up for about a week. Other than that, it's pretty slim pickings for the float and fly. As far as summertime goes, it's still the easiest tactic to catch bass on the fly, but it really doesn't work that good, so I only recommend using it if you got a real beginner with you or something, a younger kid or something like that. But other than that, summer's time for topwater and streamers. During the winter, a lot of times the grabs are just pretty much nothing. You don't, don't really see anything unless you kind of pull on the indicator yourself. So really pay attention to the indicators and be prepared for a super light take or you're going to miss uh, the majority of the fish. 
Water clarity is always a really important factor for bass fishing, but it's something that's really easy to, uh, to work with. For real murky water, Bodie's Leech Life is always my go-to, and my Chartreuse and White Wakasagi works real good as well. You just want to use darker colors or brighter colors so the fish can see the profile of the fly easier. For clear water, I typically like more realistic looking patterns. Uh, gray and white is always a really good color combo for uh, the Wakasagi or, or Shad. Usually one of the two are prevalent in the lakes out here. And again, for clear water, Bodie's Leech Life is a go-to. Yeah, sure, most people uh, kind of choose to tie their own leeches, but I strongly suggest to go to Bodie and buy his original patterns because if, uh, if you're using your own pattern, uh, I, the truth is I, I don't know how well it's going to work, but I know for a fact that Bodie's flies work really well. If you're not fishing the, the right fly, all this stuff that I'm saying could, could be going to waste. So I strongly suggest going with uh, the tested and proven fly. He's a real hard worker and he was one of the first people to use the float and fly with the fly rod with me back in uh, 2014. He's an extremely conscientious angler. He's helped me out a lot with this and he's a pioneer. Support the young man and buy local. What's that? Indicator went down for like 20 seconds. Fuck dude, I'm filming two eagles. Because these flies are all made with toxic lead, uh, when I'm in my boat, I use a tool to get all, these, uh, all the snags out. When fishing from the banks, you won't have the luxury of using a, a little trick like this. So I do advise uh, against using lead when you're, you're walking on the banks, but you gotta do what you gotta do. You can, can get away with just uh, a little tin weight uh, just above a, a woolly bug or something or some kind of a bait fish. It doesn't necessarily have to be balanced. There's all sorts of balanced leeches and balanced minnows out on the market already. So those are probably something to look into if you're fishing from the banks. The flies just need to be heavy enough to prop the indicators post straight up and down. So if you get a, a balanced leech and it's not heavy enough, you can just kind of add some weight on right above the hook and uh, that'll be good. Or you can kind of experiment and make your own tin weighted hooks like, uh, like I did here. So you can just slap something together, go give it a shot, and uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to be surprised how effective it is. So if you're interested in guided trips, I'd love to line something up. Information can be found on my website at flyfishcnv.com. CNV is in California's North Valley. I just want to want to give a, a special thanks to Kirby for showing me this, this technique. Uh, Ever since since I started using this this on the fly rod, when I applied his knowledge to the fly rod, uh, it absolutely changed my life. It took took me in a whole different path than I had ever uh, realized I'd be going. Um, now I'm I'm doing a lot of work paying the bills uh, with this this float and fly this bass stuff. Uh, it's it's just been awesome for me. Then also a, a thank you to Bodie for supplying me with flies. Uh, always being there scouting with me uh, and, and learning this this whole process. Bodie's been there from from day one pretty much of, uh, of doing this stuff. He was uh, maybe like the second or third person out of my boat doing the, the float and fly probably. He caught the the first uh, actual picture worthy fish on the float and fly. He posted the first uh, picture of a float and fly fly rod caught bass on uh, on Instagram. So. Bodie's roots go way back. He's he's been a, a huge help uh, in in pioneering this this stuff with me. Then also a special thanks to Kayla for the uh, the awesome demos that she did. Kayla's a very good guide out here in Northern California. Uh, she primarily guides out of her drift boat on the Lower Sac, uh, Fall River, uh, Hat Creek, those those fisheries up up north around Redding. Her website is HerWatersFlyFishing.com. She's also on social media, on uh, Instagram and Facebook. And something to note about Kayla as well, she was uh, one of the, the first people to be doing the, the float and fly too. Uh, she was definitely one of the, the first people on my boat uh, out there out there doing it. So this was cool to get, get all these people together, all my friends, all the people that have, have helped me with this. Uh, it, was a, it was a real pleasure fishing with, with everybody. Uh, so I hope this inspires. I hope this inspires everybody to get out and uh, try some some new stuff here. Maybe um, get out there, fish fish close close to your house, 
uh, doesn't cost you much. This stuff's uh, a lot of fun. I, I just can't, can't stress it enough. Good luck out there.